Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The 15th Sunday after Pentecost falls on September 1st, 2024. And these are the texts. The first reading, thematic, is Deuteronomy 4, verses 1 through 2 and verses 6 through 9. Or the first reading, semi-continuous, is Song of Songs, 2 verses 8 through 13. The psalm is 34 verses 9 through 14. The epistle reading, we're starting a five-week series on the book of James, chapter 1 verses 17 through 27. And then we are back to the gospel of Mark for the foreseeable future, dropping in at chapter 7, a variety of verses, 1 through 8, 14 through 15, 21 through 23. So those of you who yeah. you know went your own way during the Bread of Life season, welcome back. Welcome back. Hello, Mark, my old friend. Is there oh, gosh. Time? <laughs> we have some fun text this week. Uh, we fun. Yes. Fun. Fun. Okay. Fun. It's a interesting. Long, okay. I'm thrilled for these. This is a, a feast of riches this weekend. All righty then. Well, it is in that uh, we're back in Mark, and so that's going to be one task of the preacher to uh, get reoriented back in our year B gospel, which is Mark. And and we drop in at a, a an important place in Mark where you have a major speech of Jesus in this chapter 7. Uh, and the in particular, as I was looking at these passages for... Uh, for Labor Day weekend, at least here in the States, but then also as preachers are looking ahead often to come together Sunday or back together Sunday or rally Sunday or whatever it ends up being uh, in the next, in the next, uh, perhaps next week or, or perhaps the following week. We do have a, I think, a invitation in in this text, in the Deuteronomy text, and certainly in the book of James. So this is kind of an overall thing that I wanted to say getting started. Uh, it Of a theme of obedience or a theme of what does it mean to follow God's commands and what does it mean to live uh, to live in a way that your the faith that's inside you is demonstrable uh, or, and can be seen. And what is that correlation between what you believe and how you I act? That. And that that could be, I think that could be a, a helpful theme uh, as as in entering the program year, or at least a at least a way to orient our getting back together. What does it mean to live out uh, as people of faith, uh, and and is that is that visible uh, to others in how we are a church and how we are a community and how we uh, live our lives? So we do have some connections there. Absolutely. I thought I would mention. Yeah, should we talk about like Mark seven in particular and where we go with that and the connection yeah. to um, to Deuteronomy? Yeah, let's do that. Let's mm-hmm. do that. And I do, I do like the theme. This sort of what does it mean for us to live out the faith that we profess to have? Mm-hmm. And I think for this text in particular, with Mark and, and a real sense of integration, right? Mm-hmm. That uh, mm-hmm. that you that 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 obedience to god that uh that commitment to following god's commandments uh is is an integration of that belief and that commitment and then what that looks like on the outside or is it just appearances and uh or is there a is there a performative contradiction if you will <laughs> between <laughs> what people see about you and right. what you say you believe yeah, and I think that's worth worth some worth some pondering and homiletical thought for <laughs> sure. Uh, as we as as we yeah as we come back together again. So one direction there. One way of looking at uh, these verses in Mark with that in mind is um, th- what I sort of put up as an, an idea of what's a vice versus a virtue, um, and to be attentive to uh, virtue, which is why I liked um, your theme 
uh, I, your themed idea for the whole set of text and our return, if that's what's happening this fall, um, uh, as you are gathering together as a community and marking that you are gathering together as a community of faith. Um, as a United Methodist at this particular moment, um, looking at Mark 7, it might be newsworthy for uh for me to discuss or even define uh, the ideas like fornication and adultery um, or even pride or theft or avarice. But what about the others that are, that are in the list? What about deceit? What about slander? What about folly? So rather than uh, sort of choose what might be um, the favorite of the day or the flavor of the cultural moment, what does it mean in this idea of us being a, a called out community whose life demonstrates something that is um, has integrity with what we confess so that it's not like, oh, well, you know, I got I got eight out of 10 going. How am I doing with that? But rather to talk about, you know, what might be my issue might be different from yours. And so I'm not going to ignore my issue and point at yours and vice versa. I'm, I'm not going to um, lift up what I, you know, what, what is me and ignore you. How are we as a community um, trying to live so that what the world sees is the virtues um, rather than the legalism that has set so many people, um, that has caused so many people to walk away from the church because they just couldn't live into what was demanded of them. And they didn't see anybody doing it anyway. That lack of integrity between voice and walk, between talk and walk. I have real different entry points into Mark (laughs) seven. Great. Great. You can keep going, but yeah, I was like, wow, I was, I just read verses like two through five. Um, (laughs) It's a, it's a great text for helping people understand Jesus and his context and his Jewishness and the controversies that he gets himself in. Uh, And I think it's a a text that kind of deserves doing some teaching and walking people through and even correcting some, some misinterpretations about the ancient world. Um, Reminding people there are no laws in the old Testament that say you have to wash your hands before you eat. (laughs) It's just none. Uh, So notice that. And, but what's going on here, right? Some are washing, some are not. So Mm -hmm. even when Mark says all the Jews don't eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, like that's not, True, because we've already been told that some of Jesus' disciples who are Jewish <laughs> don't do it. So, it, right, there's something's going on here. And it's, it gets to this, this distinction that's made between commandment versus tradition. And yes. so what he's getting at here is not, you people love Torah too much. What he's getting at here, Jesus, is all your, concer- your certain concerns um, that you've adopted, certain practices of piety— which might be just fine. Um, don't tell the whole story, right? And if they miss these things that come from the heart, they miss these things, these places where true impurity resides, these behaviors that harm other people, then you're missing something. And so it's not that the Pharisees were all like, quote unquote, self-righteous or into works righteousness or some of these, these, um, these ways that get caricatured in our traditions. What you have here is a real difference of a of kind of approach to how is the law rightly honored, right? And how does one live uprightly in a world that is full of temptations and pollutions and things like that? How does one set oneself apart? And Jesus and the Pharisees had a ton in common, but at least the ways in which these dialogues are set up, right? There's this deep division about kind of where is the source? Like, what are the, where are the majors that we're going to focus on? And for that, Jesus always goes back to law. He's more of a, he's more of a, an originalist, I guess, than his, uh, his conversation partner. Ouch. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
in, in the sense that um, I'm hearing you, Matt, in the context of it's not the rules and the rituals, but it's the relationships that are um, what we talk about when we talk about those, the summation of the commandments or the summation of the law. Um, so they're using this to point the finger against Jesus and Jesus' disciples. And Jesus makes a statement that draws them into um, community, into relationship. And that drawing in does not deny the law, as you said, Jesus being an originalist. It doesn't uh, deny the law, but it definitely fulfills the law, because what the law is actually doing is not setting up rituals that would separate us, but it is enabling a community that is so um, that is so generous to one another, uh, honest with one another, um, not slandering the other, um, uh, that that the rest of the community takes note and says, oh, you guys, you guys are the kind of community that we want to be a part of. I mean, I ask preachers not to quote Matt Skinner on Jesus as an originalist, because that word carries a whole lot of baggage in American jurisprudence. <laughs> but, um, but to note that, right, he's, he is not at all anti-law or in any way snubbing Torah. No. Anyway, he's saying we've missed the boat on some things, so... Which is why it's great that this part of Deuteronomy is paired. I don't know if we want to head there or not yet, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, well, and why do you say that, Matt? Well, uh, I just love, you know, this is, here's Moses, like retelling the law at the start of Deuteronomy, right? And the it's, surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. What other great nation has statues and ordinances as just, I mean, it's this kind of, this kind of pride for the law that comes out here, right? Like we're going to be the envy of the whole world because we've got <laughs> this great vision, which of course, you know, they haven't taken the land yet. They're not a nation no. yet. This is still all being done in the hypothetical, right? Like when we're finally a nation, this is how we're going to see ourselves rule. This is how God's going to rule us. And of course mm -hmm. it doesn't go according to plan, but there's this, this beautiful embrace of the vision that Torah mm -hmm. promises um, mm -hmm. mostly because Torah is built around the heart of God, I would say. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a helpful connection too, back to Mark in terms of, you know, how is, how is that, what comes from the heart is also from the heart of God and, yes. uh, in making these connections and yeah, it's such a, it's, it, you know, you consider we're at the very beginning of Deuteronomy. And then, of course, as you said, we, they haven't even entered into the promised land yet. But this uh, but this command to or this, you know, this reminder or this assertion or affirmation of of obeying the commands of God is what's going to be distinctive of mm -hmm. this community uh, and and what is dis yeah, what is distinctive about um, God's people, and not only uh, not only as what people can see and what you know what makes that distinction, but also a remind uh, just a reminder of that relationship, right? So it's kind of brilliant on Moses's part, you know. It's like, yeah, follow the law. I mean, follow the Jesus or follow God's commands. But at the end of the day, you, you, we do this to maintain a relationship with God in part, right? And that yeah. it, that it's as you said, Matt. It's a God's the Torah, God's law is is revealing of God's deep desire to be in relationship and for us to be in right relationship with others. And so it I, I think exploring that homiletically is, could be really important for people to imagine, um, particularly to look at this this idea of law, commandments, obedience. Why why is there uh, why is there a call to obedience? Uh, and when are the, when are the times and places that we need to be reminded of it? Mm -hmm. And so if you can kind of put people on this precipice, like, you know, like Moses and God's people here to say, okay, where, where are those moments that, okay, stop. <laughs> We're going to go through all of Deuteronomy <laughs> before we get there and remind y'all of, 
who we are and what we do. And, and so that's why I think the program, programmatic year is kind of an interesting yeah. place for this, you know, yeah. as we get started and reminding us, okay, who are we? Uh, and why, why are we coming together? Uh, right. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. But the people and, there, the people looking in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the one, the re- reminder of the, in terms of timing that you've both acknowledged that this is, it, this is not yet a reality. It's looking forward. Uh, so we're beginning this year. We're beginning this season looking forward. Not everything is in hand. Not all the promises have been received, but turning back to the fact that our behavior and following these laws and building this kind of community is in direct response to the behavior of the God who characteristically is forming a relationship with us that we would form a community in the name of this God. And so that just keeps before us what what Moses has kept before the people. Ultimately, this community we form is a reflection of God's insistence on being in relationship with us. And with I, this conversation, oh, go ahead, Matt. No, you, you go ahead. No, I was going to say I would bring in Psalm 15 uh, in in this theme because you have uh, exactly uh, the you know the connections there are um, also ways to talk about this. So that's mm-hmm. all I was going to say. I was simply going to confess and repent that I accidentally said Psalm 34, 9 through 14, but it's really Psalm 15. I was reading from two weeks ago, but oops. Oh, at, the, okay. at the opening of the podcast, I read, I mentioned the wrong Psalm. So oh, oops. all right. Oops. Well. Sorry for you Psalm purists out there. <laughs> and and the whole time we've been talking, they've been reading back and forth, trying to figure out what Psalm is he referring to? I know, they're like, why do they let him read the text at the beginning anyway? He does such a horrible job at it. <laughs> Hardly. Um, I'll try again. I'm going to try again three podcasts from now. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 All right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll give well, you another Psalm shot. 15, it is in its entirety, five verses. Uh, yeah. So you've got a nice five verse, uh, five verse also summary of uh, of what it you know what it means to do what is right uh, and, and and why yeah. we do what is. Right. Before the Lord, and it, and it, and significantly such that it is relationship with one another, that it is speaking mm-hmm. truth, that it is uh, not slandering, uh, that it is not uh, uh, taking up reproach against their neighbors. Um, interestingly enough, in this particular cultural moment, this is a hard word, um, and we cannot pretend we understand it, and. Um, Dare we not overlook it because we think that that other things are more important? In fact, addressing these in terms of how we might be a better community with one another uh, might enable us to move through the other difficulties that we have. And that's not just ecclesially, but that's culturally and politically as well. Not to mention who you might be having dinner with, uh, the family members at table after church. (laughs) <laughs> it's got this uh, reference to speaking right. the truth from your heart the psalm does which mm-hmm. you know jesus right. as well does other things dwell in your heart so i mean there's this you could preach this in a way that talks about how conflicted we all are and you know that from one so i mean james would take issue with this in a couple of weeks but uh that within our heart can dwell this you know wellspring of truth but also all of the uh deceitful things that jesus talks about right but speaking of hearts, oh, here you go, oh, friends. Yeah, nice, nice segue. Grace of my beloved, bounding over go. the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Again, you know what I'm this, this whole the again this whole. What are you going to do, Matt? Oh, you go ahead, Joy. I'm going to say, again, this whole longing as we open um, the Song of Songs, which is this uh, kind of best of the best, uh, you know, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Holy of Holies, and Song of Songs. So here's that top branch, uh, and it opens um, by a longing 
in relationship. These these two are not together, and yet they are longing for one another. And as we, uh, a, a, if we were to read through uh, Song of Songs, I don't know how many people actually do this, particularly in preaching, but if you were, there would be this back and forth of the longing and the not yet uh, that is is highlighted particularly in this opening um, that we mm-hmm. get for today's lecture. Mm-hmm. What were good, you going to ma- open with, Matt? I was going to say I would preach on the entire book. Like, oh, which is the one time every three years you get this. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can talk about like, look, this is situated here because we've just talked about Solomon. You're going to get this. You're going to get three weeks of Proverbs coming up. So, yeah, you know, yeah. it's Solomon's voice. But then I would say, and you call it whatever you want to call it, Canticle of Canticles, Song of Solomon, Song of Songs. NRSB updated edition just changed it back to Song of Songs, which yeah. um, probably the right move. But to, but to talk about, you know, here's a book of erotic poetry. There's just no getting around it, right? So the Bible yeah. contains within it uh, poems about desire, about sexuality. And just to kind of sit with that for a while and ask the question, why? People might be amused to go th- if you went through some of the history of this among both Jews and Christians who are like, should we really have this book? Is this really about what we think it's about? Or is it about, you know, God's wild love for the world or for the church or for Israel? And um, it's about what you think it's about, I think, but it's also about more than that. And so it's this, Mm -hmm. just to talk about that, I've taught on this, on Song of Songs back in the spring at my church and came across a uh, work by Carrie Ellen Walsh that's really, I think, informative that that talks about here you've got some plain talk about desire. And in this passage, too, in a, in a woman's voice, mm-hmm. which is pretty odd for scripture, mm-hmm. you can say, well, this is in some ways idealized. This is a man writing as a woman's voice, which is not mm-hmm. ideal. But nevertheless, you get here like and I'm not, I'm not lecturing the two of you about this, but you got a woman's voice talking about uh, about sexuality and about desire. And what Walsh talks about is the way in which this book might heal the ways in which people have had their spirituality bifurcated from their body uh, by their yeah. religion, you know. And, yeah. mm. and what would it mean for religion to be a place where there's actually a better integration of one's whole self and one's whole experience? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's just, that's remarkable, I think, yeah. to, to think about what that would look like. And I don't, don't know if we have answers to that, but to remind people here in the canon is this one book that's still saying, don't forget about the sheer joy of being human yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, and of being alive and of being embodied, whatever that's going to look like that can take, that can take shape in a number of ways without making anything normative. Mm-hmm. But don't forget that God has created us to indwell with del- to indwell the world with just sheer delight. So, mm-hmm. sorry, that's my long and, mini sermon. You two no, talk now, so, and I'll just I'll learn. No, I think that's great. And just just to reiterate the fact that uh, that yeah, this is the only time it appears in the lectionary, and so uh, it it yeah, it's an opportunity to preach on a book and do a little teaching on a book that a lot of people are like, what? <laughs> what is this? Jump around. Like? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and really, uh, yeah. Expose them to a, a, a genre, a piece of literature that's very different. And, and to ask some of those questions, like, what is it doing in the Bible? And uh, why, why, yeah. What, what, what do we, what do we do with this? And what, it, what, like, as you were talking about, Matt, what is it about faith that this opens up um, that we hadn't thought about before? So, yeah, yeah that, I love that. that I, do, yeah. I do too. Do I, that, yeah. This, um, a, a reminder that uh, um, I think it's significant that uh, the majority of this is spoken in a woman's voice and, and um, it does not say anywhere that this is written by Solomon. I mean, the tradition of the wisdom tradition and yada yada is, but uh, this is about the desire of of one person to another person. And we remember Solomon 
he he wasn't really into that one on one. He kind of had him a few uh, wives and a few women on the side. Um, so um, some people questioned his wisdom uh, to have that many mother in laws. But I digress. Uh, but um, that that what we have here is uh, a way to talk about the reality of desire. And to remember that whenever the Bible uses metaphors, it's something that humanity clearly understands. And if there's one thing that we clearly understand, is it's what it is to desire to be loved and fully known by another. And if we use that metaphor uh, that God is desiring to know and be known fully by us and to display that God fully knows us, um, and uh, the recognition that throughout uh, the Old Testament, adultery and idolatry are used almost synonymously to talk about broken relationship. And so this, whether you're talking about the the just in flesh embodied reality of our lives or something that we know so completely um, that helps us understand the community and relationship that God is calling for us. This cannot be just a metaphor ideal idea. This has to be something we fully understand, which means, as you said, Matt, it means what it reads like it means, because that's the only way we're going to get just how deep this love is that God is um, asking us to engage in. Or you could do a five-week series on James. So many so choices. You right. So what? many choices. So many choices. What are, uh, what so are they? Said, yes. It's, Matt it's, said it's, something it's, about this being a rich, a rich set of texts. Yes. Wealth of opportunities here. Five five week uh, time on James, and uh, I, the first thing I would say would be to point people to the commentary by Margaret Amer. It's a it's a rerun, uh, but it it um, not and uh, not but and. But the the thing that she says is uh, each section of today's lectionary passage could become its own sermon. I thought that was really helpful. There is so much here. Uh, and you can do, you know, of course, an introduction, an introduction to James. Um, but and but then, as she says throughout all of these verses, what does it mean to live as a Christian? As a Christian. And uh, and and these initial these initial answers of James are then going to uh, going to um, get. Uh, deeper and more, uh, uh, more articulate as the letter goes on. But it's a really, it's a very worthwhile and important question. And I think, especially going in, at least in the states, going into a really uh, challenging fall of <laughs> of how that is even defined or what that even means to be a Christian, uh, at least in the states here. So. Um, with the the obvious thing happening <laughs> in November, yeah, it's it's. I think it's it's really interesting this time of the year, like you said, entering into an election season, mm -hmm. talking about what it means to be Christian. This is a book that has a lot to say about speech and about your mm -hmm. speech having integrity. And mm -hmm. James hates double mindedness. It's also mm -hmm. a book that has references to people who are being um, can't get a fair hearing in courts. It has references to people who aren't being paid for their labor, which makes it really interesting to fall here on, on Labor Day as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so it does lay out a variety of justice issues, but also not so much to rail against others, but to ask the church, right? With whom are you aligning yourselves? Uh, to whom are you showing favoritism? And what does it mean to live Christianly? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and people can draw their own connections, I think. That's right. Doers uh, of the word. And not hearers only. I I love also, or I like also to look at uh, at James and remind us when we talk about what does it mean to live at Christ, as a Christian, is that uh, James, the brother of Jesus, which means they learned these lessons uh, growing up in Mary's house. Um, and, and so when you're reading through James, particularly if you take this lead to allow the next five weeks to be what, uh, what you, um, preach from, look for the ways in which James 
sounds a whole lot like the Jesus we get in the Gospels. Um, there, there sometimes we don't pay attention to how we're getting the same message when we're not, you know, doing what we do when we compare Mark's gospel to Luke's gospel or to, to um, Matthew's gospel. But just these ideas that we get, as you pointed out, Matt, in terms of these justice ideas, these are the very ideas that Jesus has taught and that we've been reading from Jesus, and we get them in this book of James. And I think that's another vantage point uh, for which we can enter into answering this question, what does it mean to be Christ-like? And I think, too, one one other thing I would say is that a, a verse that's very important or a phrase that's very important in all of this is verse 18, uh, because I you that we would become a kind of first fruits that what this doers of the word is uh as as god's own first fruits right are the were were these were the results of of uh the birth of the word of truth and so this is not this is not just how to live but it really is uh, our very beings being these first fruits of god yes Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.